So I think I've got a very good introduction by Karsten and also Patrick, so thank you very much. Uh, now everybody knows uh, what I'm gonna talk, and that's very good because I can focus then on the, on the details. So I'm gonna present the work we are carrying on at 60 -ish. This is a new working group that was formed uh, last, uh, uh, last summer on the ITF, and we will try to, pr uh, to bring IPv6 connectivity on low power industrial wireless mesh networks. And the, and the term industrial is important here because they have some properties, they have some characteristics that make them different do, than uh, current uh, wireless mesh networks for home and for other uh, scenarios. So this protocol stack has already been presented and you know about co-op, you know about UDP, you know about six low pen. We've been, talk, we've been talking a little bit about 15.4 and now I introduce here 15.4e, Patrick also uh, explain a little bit. My presentation will focus on a gap here that exists in, in solutions that you can buy from customers, but is not standard. So each customer has their own implementation of this binding layer. And what we are doing here is trying to homogenize, standardize, provide the rules so everyone can implement that in a, in a standard compliant way. I also will introduce a little bit how 1540 works and I think it's important to understand how it works because it's pretty different than previous version of 15.4. And, and this is why also, because the way this protocol works, we need to cover some things here. So the first thing I will present is the wireless challenges. So we need to understand the wireless medium and the problems it has. And especially in industrial uh, scenarios. Then I will talk about 1540 and then I will introduce what we do at 60. So the first challenge we have when we talk about wireless communications is that we have external interference. So, and especially in our, in our constrained devices, we have uh, low power radios and we have narrow band channels. So we are very prone to be interference by other technologies and this is an we are using ISM bands, so these bands are open. Any technology, any radio manufacturer can use that bands to make their chips. So uh, we have many problems here, and we need techniques to deal with that, and especially in industrial scenarios, because we have some requirements such as reliability. We don't want to lose packets if we have to stop a, a machine pressing a button. The second challenge is multipath fading, and this is related to the fact that uh, waves bend when they collide with objects or if they have uh, metallic uh, things around, they change their face and they become destructive interferences. So this, the same wave can destroy itself because it's bending somewhere. And this is a thing that happens more when you are talking to narrow band radios. So you have your uh, bandwidth smaller, so this effect uh, happens much, much more. To understand all this, what we did uh, a couple of years ago, it was an experiment, and what we did is we draw in a paper, a kind of square uh, thing like this, uh, with that size, 20 centimeters by 35 centimeters, and we took a wireless transmitter and a wireless receiver, and we sent 1,000 packets from the transmitter to the receiver separated a, a meter, and for each of these positions and we computed how many packets arrive at the receiver. And we plotted that result. So as you see, this is the shape of the paper that we use. And according to the position of the device, we got uh, from 100% packets delivered to 0% packets delivered, uh, and in only in 20 centimeters difference. So depending on where you put your device, you, you have lots of chances to be able to transmit or in contrast, fail all the packets you send. And this is a thing that exists and is real and it's on the wireless, is the property of the wireless medium. So we cannot fight on a particular channel against that. What we did later was to test all the channels. Look the 16 channels and see what happened. And what happens is that the shapes that we observe are not correlated. 
This means that if I'm a node and I'm in a bad position and I'm transmitting a packet and I fail, if I choose another channel, I have lots of chances to be in a good position because th there's no real correlation. And this property is very, very important because this tells us that using channel hopping, slow channel hopping, when we communicate, we can improve a lot the reliability of our network. And this is what 1540 uses. So they provide a lot of reliability by using this slow channel hopping. So every time they send a packet, they change channel uh, to send the next one. So now let's talk a little bit about 1540, a little bit how it works. This is a reminder what it is. It's a MAC layer. It's an amendment of the 15.4 standard that proposes some new MAC layers. And we will especially talk about the mode called time slot channel hopping. And this was published the 16th of April 2012. So it's a pretty new standard. And it's not a new standard. In fact, it's only a revision. It's an amendment of the, the, physical, uh, the MAC layer uh, defined by 15.4. What it uh, provides is ultra low power operation, synchronizing the modes. And synchronizing the modes is very important because uh, instead of using CSMA uh, transmissions, we have the modes synchronized and they exactly know when they have to transmit. Knowing that, you save a lot of energy because you don't need to CCA and retransmit if there's collisions because you exactly know when you have to turn on the radio. And the receiver also exactly knows when it has to turn on the radio to receive. So in that sense, we don't have idle listening nodes trying to catch the packet. And also uses, as I said, uh, channel hopping. So the MAC layer is a structure in a super frame. We call super frame the structure. That is, I split time in time slots. And also I have the 16 available channels. This builds this kind of mesh. And a node can be configured to transmit in one of these little cells. This means that if E has to transmit to C, it will transmit at time slot, whatever it is that one, and that channel offset. So this structure repeats over time. So when, I, when the time elapses, it goes here, and then it starts again. So a node follows this schedule. It has, if it has more cells scheduled, then we'll have more links or more packets. We will see that. A slot, so what happens in one of these cells? The slot starts, and on the top we have the transmitter, on the bottom we have the receiver. Let's, let's look at the transmitter first. The slot starts and the transmitter is off, so all the hardware is off, nothing is running, except a little timer that is able to wake up all the hardware. So the timer at a certain point on time in the slot wake, wakes up the hardware and toggles the radio to transmit the packet. And this happens exactly at this offset within the slot. Let's say 2.120 milliseconds. And this is a point of time that it's known also by the receiver. So this is fixed. The receiver is sleeping and uh, it turns on a little bit before the exact time when the sender will transmit the packet. And this is because we want a little war time here because clocks between nodes drift. So we don't know if they are completely aligned or they are shift by some microseconds, okay? So it turns on and eventually receives the packet. And then the same applies to the acknowledgement. The, the sender waits a little bit with everything off and then just turns on with a little bit of work time to get the acknowledgement. Every time two modes, two nodes communicate, they align their clocks because if, I, uh, if the transmitter is expected to send the packet here at that point, and the receiver receives it somehow in that war time, it knows how, fa how far it is from the exact point. So it knows the drift between, with respect to the other node. And then it can correct its drift. So every time there's a communication, nodes align their clocks. And this maintains the network synchronized. Also, 1540 defines other mechanisms like keep alive, uh, keep alive and becomes to maintain, maintain the, the network synchronized. And how, how fast the network desynchronizes depends on the crystals, on the hardware crystals you have on your hardware. So you can buy very expensive time temperature compensated crystals and then your modes hardly ever desynchronize, but you can have cheap crystals and then you need to synchronize more. So uh, a channel hopping 
words uh, following a formula or a mechanism. Let's say that time slots start counting from zero, but they never end. We have like a five byte number that it's our, it, if you compute uh, with time slots of 10 seconds, this gives us 350 years to count on. And uh, each time slot has an absolute sequence number. Uh, the cell has also a channel offset, and then we have a particular a slot offset within the slot frame that repeats over time. With that symbol formula, we get the real frequency channel that we have to transmit at each slot. And this, sorry, and this causes that in that slot frame, imagine that I will transmit a channel 11 when this elapses and I go again to the next slot frame because the slot sequence number will have changed, then the next time I transmit, I will use another channel. And this ensures a kind of random pattern of selecting the next channel I have to use. And this is very useful to mitigate the effect of multipath because in average, I get a very good uh, reliability. I don't lose in average lots of packets. And this is what some papers show uh, and this 99.999% reliability on this kind of networks. So having a schedule is very good because uh, we can do many things here. Depending on how we schedule cells, we can have uh, more packets per second. For example, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, this blue, they correspond to this. So if in a time frame I have more slots to transmit from D to B, I will be able to send more packets. I can improve latency because I can schedule uh, uh, nodes in a row. So I have first uh, H to F, the second one F to D, D to B, B to A. So I improve latency. Or I can have robustness by using uh, different links to point on different routes and then uh, have like redundancy on the path my, my data will flow. So uh, 15, for, this is a kind of summary. This is what happens in the slot and how the network operates. But what is important is that uh, this standard does not define how we build this schedule and how we maintain it. So it says we have to use the schedule, but nobody says how we have to build it and maintain and configure that network. And this is still open. So what vendors did is they implemented the Mac layer and they, they built some components that do their own scheduling. And this can be centralized or distributed, but nobody tells how they do because it's a kind of private thing. So uh, this protocol started, or idea, the ideas found, the foundation ideas of this protocol started uh, in 2006 by this protocol invented uh, by DAS Networks. Then this evolved to another very well known industrial standard, which is wireless HAR, and it has the same foundation. And in 2012, 154E uh, uh, took that ideas and put them also in an IEEE standard. Nowadays, in, uh, in a lot of industries, in heavy industries like oil refineries, uh, you know, pipe monitoring and all that, they are using that technology. So here's where 60s group comes. And we try to fill the gap between having a IP enabled uh, architecture and putting it on together, uh, putting it over this uh, 1540E Mac layer. And the gap is how we can have a standardized way to schedule these networks. What are the mechanisms we need to configure the underlying Mac layer to accommodate to six low pan, to accommodate it, to ripple, to work on them, and all that. So this world up, as I said, started in, uh, we started like uh, private discussions in December 2012, like with, within people that we were in this world. And then uh, we created a mailing list in January 2013, and suddenly we, we realized that we were 160 members in a few weeks. So there's a lot of interest on that technology. We met like extra officially on the ITF meeting in Orlando in March 2013, we were not even a group, so we just met there to start planning how, how to proceed. We prepared our buff for ITF 87 in Berlin and uh, we got accepted after some modifications. We were very ambitious in our initial, initial ideas, but then we, we had to start a little bit slower. 
And uh, two weeks ago, we were in Vancouver and we started, uh, we presented some of the drafts that we are working on and some of them got adopted for, as a working group document, so things are moving forward. So here's some information. There's a mailing list. We, it's pretty active. We have every, every week we have a, a phone call. It's on Fridays morning and eight in the morning here. We have published several drafts, uh, which describe uh, part of our our work. And the charter of the group uh, and the main scope now, as it is defined on the ITF is to define an architecture to describe the design of Cystic Scenario Board. So how, how this is architecture, how uh, IP is put on this kind of deterministic TSEH networks. We need to define information models containing the management requirements of a Cystic. So what's the data that we have to send to nodes to be able to configure them? What's the interaction API? What's the management APIs for that? Uh, for that uh, uh, layer, and also define a minimal mode of operation of uh, 15.4e because it's very open. So 15.4e enables everything, so we need to define or narrow a little bit the configuration of 15.4e to define an a initial way to bootstrap the network and enable people to build the, bring their implementations and interoperate. So this is uh, uh, the third uh, big thing that we have to work on. And this will be a static schedule. So we are not even facing for how to do a centralized scheduling or distributed. We are only thinking now and have a static schedule and have best effort routes using Ripple on top. So this is the architecture. Uh, you've seen all uh, this slide in, in Karsten and, and Patrick presentations. Uh, we have the low power Lucy network. We can have multiple backbone routers, uh, each of them being a root of a Ripple tree. Uh, and this will be connected to a, a backbone subnet, and we can have there a PCE path computation engine or element that will be able to compute the schedule of the network and send this schedule to the nodes. This is a centralized approach. We are, we are also looking on having the centralized approaches where the nodes in the network can decide the schedules according to the application needs, like I need that bandwidth, how I schedule a path to the gateway or to the, to the that root of the network uh, that meets my bandwidth requirements. And how can I do that in a decentralized way? So we are aiming to support both, both cases. So to do that, we define a six top layer. Six top will be in a management layer on top of 15.4e and under higher layers like 6LOPAN. And this layer will take care of the information and data models that we will define. So what's the information we carry through the network and convert these packets into operations to, uh, and configuration to the 15.4e network uh, layer. This is an initial set of commands that we are defining. I will not go through them, but basically there's one to create or update or delete a cell. So how I install a cell in the schedule, how I, and we differentiate hard cells and soft cells and these are little details. Uh, how I configure the enhanced beacon of the network. So this is how I configure how often my network advertises so others can join and so on. So there's lots of things we can configure here. And the main objective is to support both operations, centralized and distributed. In the case of centralized, we will have a path computation engine that is able to compute the schedule of the network and through the backbone router send that configuration using co-op to each of the nodes of the network. Then the, the, when, the, the, when the code packet reaches one of these nodes, it calls the Sigstop API, and Sigstop will take care of configuring TSEH. This is one approach. Another approach is to have it in a distributed way. So I I'm a node in the network, and I have a bandwidth requirement, uh, sending three packets per minute. And I tell to the Sigstop layer, please, ensure that I will, I will be able to send that, that number of packets. And then Sigstop has to take care of installing that packets in my schedule, but also talking to the neighbor, so the neighbor knows that I will transmit on a particular slot, because this is deterministic. So here there's a lot of mechanism on monitoring and reacting against bad links and all that. So another draft we are working on, uh, 
explains how using co-op we can manage the resources of a node. And this is a pretty simple approach based on a REST API. So each node will offer a set of URIs that will be used to configure the node. So for example, when I want to query the neighbor table of a node, I will call this uh, REST operation with a GET or a PUT or a POST, and I will uh, get an answer according to what, what I do. So we are defining also these URIs to interact with, them, with the nodes. The final step is to provide a minimal configuration. So what's the minimal configuration of a, a TSCH network? So others can interoperate, we define that, and it's pretty simple. Uh, we have 101 slots, so our slot frame is defined to have 101 slots. The first slot is used to advertise the network, and the next five slots are shared, slotted Aloha approach, shared slots where nodes can uh, either transmit or receive, but they are shared, so there can be collisions. It's not completely deterministic. But this approach is, uh, good uh, in order to bootstrap the network because I don't need to have any knowledge. I just start and I try to transmit in any of these. If I have collision, I back off and I try in another one. But this enables to build the, rub, the, the ripple topology very easily. I can start getting information of my neighbors and, and build the ripple topology. And uh, it also can be used as a fallback mode. So imagine that then I schedule my network, I get a path to the PC, the PC installs all the scheduling and everything works in a scheduled way. But my by, for some reason, things start to fail. I always can come back to this mode of operation to recover. So it's a fallback mode of operation as well. The final thing that we do is define how Ripple works on that network. And our approach is to use uh, RFC 6552, which is uh, the objective function zero that defines how uh, the rank of nodes is computed. And uh, here we are proposing as, a, uh, as, you, uh, as the uh, rank factor element of this function to use expected transmissions, which is the inverse of the probability delivery ratio. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, what we propose because it's uh, the most simple approach to have a, a routing topology in a standard way. So, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, guys, any questions? Oh, just a question about some of the techniques that are being looked at in the, in the working group. Um, you showed in the grid of time slots and so on how uh, you know, the things that got assigned to a cell was like you know, A sending to B and, and, and B sending to C and so on. Uh, it wasn't that one I'm thinking of, but that's, that's a fine picture. Um, and so the question is, in terms of when a node, say, C is able to receive versus the slots when C is able to send, okay, is there discussion of trying to put the send slot as close as possible after the receive slot for cases where they're either doing a forward or a response? Yes, or Because yeah. it seems like you'd want to minimize the in-end packet latency and also minimize the time that the radio has to come up because there's some spin down time. And so is that one of the factors that's taken into account is the send slot versus the receive slot trying to keep those close? So there's many different approaches. and uh, th This is part of the scheduling policy. And right. what we will do on, on, on uh, 6 stitch is not to force any scheduling policy because then vendors will be uh, angry with us. Because if someone has an implementation and he wants to be standard compliant, uh, he has to change their implementation. And some, some applications of this technology are treated for you know, oil and gas monitoring and some others are for other applications. So the scheduling technique in, in itself cannot be standardized. What we can provide is all the tools and all the mechanisms to install the links that some central algorithm computes uh, to the nodes. So we will not say exactly uh, how to do that. But we will provide, so the, the sixth top layer will provide monitoring information. We'll be all the time looking, okay, what's the PDR of this node? Uh, what, what's the PDR of this node, of this cell? And it would be better to change and it will suggest to the PC or to the distributed algorithms, okay, wh why not we change because this cell is not good. But also note that as this repeats over, over time, it doesn't matter that, well, it matters, but 
it doesn't matter a lot if you send here and here than if you send here and so if you are like back you, you mean you know what I mean so if I receive here and I send here I, I optimize latency but if I, I uh, send here and I receive here I lose I lose only one slot because in the next one I will have in the buffer another one in queue so I will send the previous one right Yes, but each packet ends up with an extra round. Yeah, yeah, and then I, I lose right. memory. Yes, I lose one packet of memory. Is there an optimization function to streamline so you have a nice propagation for, you know, front, first node to last node type of thing? Yeah, this for sure the, the scheduling uh, approach uh, can do that, of course. But it's not something you do. You would rely on the no, no. main node. No, no, so we don't focus on how a central or a distributed scheduler works. We can we provide the tools to, to them to install them into the nodes. Only the communication. Because vendors want to implement their own optimization. Are there any standards that do that? No, did you and I don't custom? think it will be standards on that. Um, any thought in terms of using the, the new fast wire or steered beam uh, antenna technology on, on your multipath fading issues? Well, yeah, there's many approaches to improve that, but uh, and you can have MIMO antennas and, you know, um, many different hardware approaches, but uh, as we are using super narrow band, the, the effect is always there. Because uh, at at 2.4, uh, you have to separate antennas, I think, 10 centimeters at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, but sometimes the node is lambda and a half. Yeah. And, but the nodes sometimes are super tiny. So you cannot have a 10 centimeter separation on antennas. Right. Well, you would do the orthogonal. Yeah. The, the yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. For sure, that hardware manufacturers will do that. We focus more on the network. There's a question from online of if you had the uh, six dish URLs available at all uh, in terms of the working group URLs. Those. What do you mean the URL? Well, the, yeah. Yeah, so the six dish is uh, it's already a, a group. So you can, you can join the mailing list. We, we have uh, this homepage where we keep all our draft working. Also, we keep, uh, uh, I think here is not the, the, the here it isn't the, the six dish work working group on ITF. The website is not here. So, but if you, you Google six dish working group, it the six dish working group. So it's it is up on the ITF now. Yes, yes. Okay, I think that's what they were asking for. 